Okay. So we are still at the WN60, and I'm just going to interview another time a Paul Rainier, who is a recognized history and a World War II specialist of the German defenses, who's standing above one of those mortar positions. So, Paul, what can you tell us of these uh, two mortar positions that we have here? Well, as you can see, the two mortar positions here are facing Omaha Beach. Fortunately, the tree is in the way, <laughs> but they have a clear view all those years ago of Omaha Beach and these two Morton positions would have fired down onto the beach onto the arrival of the American soldiers. Okay, w were the Allies actually uh, aware of this uh, German position, the WN-60? Funnily enough, all the aircraft uh, reconnaissance done before D-Day did not show a strong point on this part of the cliff at all. So we were well camouflaged and uh, they did not concentrate on this particular point. The main strong points that they did attack was 61, which is at the bottom of the cliff, and 62, which you may be able to see from here, I don't know. But there is a draw, or a valley, putting it in English terms, which comes straight up inland, and that was the main concentration that the American forces actually made for to get a breakthrough onto the shore and up through that valley. They did not know that there was another little valley here. So I believe that one uh, soldier quite famous, Ludwig Wittemonte, did something incredible here on the WN60. Yeah, Jimmy Monteith was uh, a, a second in command of K Company, the 16th Infantry Regiment of the 1st uh, American Division, the Big Red One. He in fact was stuck at the bottom of the cliffs because where we have been earlier, at the bottom here, are steep cliffs. He was joined by the remain, remains of two companies of, worth of men and they came up under the lip here, this small valley, which the Germans had not actually protected. But we will show you the valley when we leave the establishment. And he attacked and came round across the minefield and attacked the actual strong point from the rear. And the Germans had not concentrated any firepower on inland defences. Everything was pointing to the beach and out at sea. So what, what was uh, at the back in the fields then? Sorry? What did, what did you have at the back of the fields? Back of the field was the minefield. Right. But there was maybe the odd machine gun position, but nothing concentrated. Everything was geared to face the sea and the beaches. Okay. And he came through the minefield with his two companies and attacked. Out of the 40 soldiers that were guarding or employed in this particular site, 33 survived the attack and surrendered at 9 o'clock that morning on the 6th of June. So was this a permanent position or were actually there was some shift of soldiers in the night or during the day? The actual shift, this was a permanent position, what they call a static position. There were two types of positions uh, on the Atlantic Wall. One was a mobile one which you could move around, which had tractors to move the heavy guns. And when they were in position, nine times out of ten, they were set in concrete casements. The static positions were in fact mini uh, bunkers where cannons on wheels were drafted in and could be put in permanent positions and not moved at all. And this was part of a static company. Well, thank you very much for this uh, very short brief history, which is very rich, of course. Thank you, Paul. The last thing on Monteith, he unfortunately during the attack was, was wounded and he uh, unfortunately later on during the course of the day he actually died of his wounds. But he was, in fact, uh, given the honour uh, by the presentation, President Citation, he was granted the, the Medal of Honour. And unfortunately, as we now know, he did not live to receive it. Thank you very much, Paul.